Session two, we're going to start off with Peter Corbett. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Peter or some of his projects. So he's the CEO of iStrategy Labs, which is a creative agency here in DC. But he's also the guy behind DC Week, which is, how you said, 100,000? 10,000. 10,000 strong here in DC. One day it'll be 100,000. Um, but he's going to give a talk about kind of what he's built in DC and, and stuff like that. So Peter, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. So while I uh, switch this audio on here, just bear with me for one second. Um, I hope everyone out there in, in virtual land is having a great Friday morning and that you've got incredible weekend plans. So we got this going and we got slides up, ready to roll. And we are off. All right, so if you ever want to find me, and I'm Corbett3000 on Twitter, uh, just mention me and I'll, I'll at reply you and we can chat. I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about we kind of call ecosystem thinking um, and how open innovation makes you stronger. So uh, hopefully all of you, when you're thinking about new businesses or you're, you're thinking about your role, you're thinking about the world in general, right? It's interesting, when I travel, I travel all over the world. Uh, when I go to certain countries and I'm not gonna, well, I, maybe I will call them out, Finland, everyone wants to build something that all of Finland would use. And you're like, why, why just all of Finland? American entrepreneurs are like, we want the entire world to use this thing, right? So think about the entire world as your playground. And then there's probably a subselect. There's this ecosystem that you need to be aware of, right? So these are the, the suppliers and the buyers and the talent, all the things within your sphere that you kind of need to know about, right? And then inside that is your venture, right? It's your startup. And when you keep going, you keep drilling down, you zoom in a little bit, you see, OK, you know, I've got this startup idea, or maybe I actually have a viable business. Maybe I have something that's generating revenue and profit. Uh, where are those little holes, those, where's the permeal membrane? Where does that crossover happen between my ecosystem and your startup? And actually, if you think about it really deeply, if you have a really interesting business, you'll notice that the entire structure of your company actually is semi-permeable, right? So the people that come in and out of it, whether they be your employees or your contractors, your customers or whatever, there is really no division between the ecosystem and yourself. And when you can start to see that and think about that, you might think, well, why would I only spend my time growing my startup? Right? Why would I spend 100% of my time building the business? Because if I'm only focused on that, there's this whole ecosystem around me that I'm ignoring. And what happens when you ignore that? Right? And what happens if you don't ignore that? What happens if you actually really, 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 really focus on that? And so what we do at iStrategy Labs, for our, this is basically our business um, from an um, ecosystem map perspective. So I think about our ecosystem, you know, our clients are typically big brands, our suppliers, if you could call them that, would be like media companies if we're buying advertising, um, or talent if we need a, you know, animation or music or sculptors or whatever. But we have this really, really big community around us. And over the past, iStrategy Labs is three and a half years old, over the past three and a half years, um, we've grown a community of people that know who we are, love what we do, and if I had a problem or a need or whatever, reaching out to roughly 15,000 people is not a problem and we, the whole world would come to us. I said, oh, I really need this esoteric thing, right? The, the community around us would say, oh, here it is. Talk to this person, have that person. If I had only really focused on us and our startup, we wouldn't have that and things would be harder. We wouldn't have the ability to grab the opportunities that we have so quickly, right? Because I'd have to say no to so many different things that might be really interesting when someone like a Geico calls and says, Peter, which was our first big client, can you build this crazy social network for cavemen to meet their uh, cave women matches? I'm like, hold on a second, let me call you right back. Hey guys, can we do this, can we do this? Yeah, we can, okay. Yeah, no problem, absolutely, let's do it. It's great, right? So in the beginning I had a real small community, but now it's grown much bigger. Then we have this cloud, right? We call it our talent cloud. It's about 500 people. It's 500 people who we've either worked with in the past. Um, in the past three and a half years, we've contracted over 300 people, right? So from a, an accountant's parlance, that's 1099s. Right, that's 300 1099s. People have worked with us in a real way, meaning we've given them money, they've given us services, we've collaborated. And beyond that, the other 200 are people that we really, really would love to work with and we're ready to pull them in on something when the time is right and we find that opportunity. And inside that is our core team, right? 14 people, these are our, our full-time employees. Um, they're the ones that are, that, they're iStrategy Labs, right? And through all of that, this procession, you see these arrows kind of cycling in from, from these concentric circles, everything is possible. Right, literally everything. I, I don't think we can't do something that we really would want to do. If someone came to me and said, Peter, we want to do a 20,000 person festival in two months, 
and we, that has happened, and we've said, yeah, no problem, let's do it, and we've done it and crushed it, right? I couldn't really do that if it was just the core team, if it was just our little company. So understanding we have this massive cloud of talent around us and this big community behind us that helps us have a stronger ecosystem has been an incredible um, asset to us and a, and a great thing to learn and know. If I had investors, I think people would have said, Peter, you're crazy. You don't spend enough time focused on your business. I spend 50% of my time focused on building community. I, you know, we do DC Tech Meetup every month. It's about 600 to 800 people that come together to focus on you know, doing tech demos or uh, hearing from founders. Last month we had you know, Aaron Battalion, the CTO of Living Social, come and talk, and the founder of Opower, and all of our biggest, most amazing startups in DC. And I think we had about eight different demos all focused on big data. Uh, the other thing we do, uh, which Daniel had alluded to, was D is DC Week, which will be in November. Um, it was 6,000 people last year. We announced it three and a half months later, 6,000 people showed up to over 200 events, sessions, big opening party, 2,200 people, big closing party, sold out the 930 Club. Um, what that does is it gives me the ability to see you know, who does what, who's great at what, where does the community need to be strengthened and when and how and what can we do to make that happen. I think over the past you know, six years that I've been here, God, I don't even know, I've connected thousands and thousands of people that have gone on to become co-founders or something. They found their designer, they found their developer, they found their funder, they found their boyfriends, their girlfriends, their wives, their husbands, maybe, I don't know, that's not that, it's not that kind of show today, right? Um, so focusing on community, if I could, literally, if I could, I would focus 100% of my time on this, because it's what I realize I'm the most passionate about. So much more passionate about building a strong and healthy community than I really am about making money in any way, shape, or form, and that's not the motivation of our business. Um, I know that and I trust that and I don't even really have to think about it that this stuff will re return 10x over the course of my lifetime. And I don't think about it from like, oh, if I put in you know, 10 hours of work on community stuff this week, then I know that I'm going to make 10 grand in projects or whatever. If I did that, I would become so transactional and that really pure intention would be destroyed. So I encourage you not to think about what is the return on the investment of your time in community building. Just do it. That sweat will be returned to you, whether it's in social capital, right, which is people loving you and saying, this person's incredible, they've done something great, you can trust them, you should know them, et cetera. Or it may be returned to you in actual physical capital or otherwise. And so I actually did a talk somewhat similar to this the other day, and I asked, and there's people who knew me very well, and I said, you know what, I know that from all the investment I've done in the community, I literally could go broke, but never go hungry and never be living on the streets. How many people here would let me sleep on your couch at least for a couple weeks? And like 100 people you know, raised their hands. And I was like, see, right? So all of that investment is worth something somewhere, but don't try to nail it down. As soon as you try to nail it down, it becomes way too tangible and you become transactional. And someone's like, this guy's just trying to sell me something, not trying to do something good, right? So you have to tell yourself that all the time. So I do, I, you know, there are some, small principles um, that I think are really important that I live by um, and that our team lives by because this is all sort of um, hints into what our culture is like at iStrategy Labs. Um, we give more than we take and I think that's really important. I've seen so many people take more than they give and as soon as I see that I'm just like, are you that stupid? Like are you that short-sighted that you can't understand that taking more than you give is going to actually make the ecology around you weaker? Think about it from that osmosis process I was talking if I came into it, I was like, I'm going to try and take as much value out of this ecosystem as possible. Guess what? I'm pretty good at what I do. We probably could suck that thing dry, and it would die. And guess what? We would die in the end, right? But instead, we've been building and growing this much bigger ecosystem around us, and so we naturally stretch out and become bigger and stronger along with it, which means we can grow into a bigger space rather than depleting something entirely. Um, so giving without expectation, I know that I've alluded to. I think that's incredibly important. And the last thing is finding a mission um, bigger than yourself or greater than yourself. That's sort of totally cliche. If you've ever read any books on entrepreneurship or whatever, but it's 1,000% the most important thing that you can do. Um, when I walk into a room, no one really cares if iStrategy Labs does design and development work or marketing campaigns or whatever. They care the fact that we have building one of the most innovative and creative communities in the capital region that's ever existed. And I've met people that have been in this, this space for 20, 30 years and like, I have never seen anything like this happen in Washington, D.C. before. This is the most exciting time I've seen in the region ever. This is incredible. What most people in D.C. don't actually know is that we're doing this globally, right? So I can, I can drop into Amsterdam or Helsinki or Germany or, or Barcelona or Australia and people will go, oh my God, you guys are at Strategy Labs and you're doing this? To create a global brand like that in a short period of time was only possible because we kept this worldview and this ecosystem thinking concept in mind and realize that we exist much more so than in 
Washington, D.C., or much more so than in just in, in the United States. And what we really were about was building this tribe of creative innovators globally, giving them what they needed to succeed, literally what they needed to live their dreams. And sometimes that's literally just connecting someone via email to get them that next step forward to the next person they need to talk to. Sometimes it's more, you know, sometimes it's rebuild their project. Sometimes it's we find them their angel investor. Sometimes it's who knows, right? But the, the key principle is we do that without expecting anything back. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to connect you to this guy, and if I do that, you do your deal, you give me 10%. Like, no one wants to talk to that guy, right? So we're not those guys and gals. And so, you know, I'm not big into mission statements, but I, I just kind of espoused it off the cuff as to what it is, and this is what it might look like in, in copy. So I'll just read it. Um, it's our responsibility to shift DC over the coming years so we can bring density and resources to innovators who seek greatness for themselves and those around them. I think drilling down to DC itself is really important. And I struggled with it for a little while. And I was like, you know, am I, am I not thinking big enough? Because there's the whole world, you know? Don't people say, I want to change the world? And I'm saying, I want to change DC. And I realized that if we couldn't actually change DC, we couldn't change the world. We wouldn't be good enough. We, if we couldn't do that, how could we possibly change the world? And we're realizing what DC is is really just a lever for the entire world. This place has changed in, in dramatically in the past five or six years. And it's going to change dramatically in the next three to five years as well. And I think that our work, we're probably like 30% of the way done. It's going to take us another decade to do all the things that we know we need to do. But once that's done, it's the platform has been created and hopefully won't really need us. Right? That's what actually frightens me a little bit is like, do people rely on us a little bit too much for you know, creating these innovative ecosystems in this region? And I want to make sure that we grow additional leaders everywhere um, that we interact. Because God forbid I get hit by a bus, you know, a lot of this work might, might not get done. So I want to talk a little bit more about open innovation. Um, hopefully you guys are interested and excited about what that is. And I'll just talk about it briefly through examples. We got, in, we got uh, into this space probably, what, two and a half years ago when Vivek Kundra, who is now the federal CIO, he's, he's leaving, actually just announced this week, to join Harvard. Um, he's the first CIO in the country, manages an IT portfolio of $70 billion, right? Kind of a big deal. So when he was the CTO of the city, he said, Peter, um, we've got 400 data sets, everything from um, real-time crime statistics to school test scores to locations of broken parking meters and potholes and procurements and all this other stuff. But it's not useful for anybody. Um, what would you do if you were me? I said, well, I don't know. I'd, I'd put on a contest. I'd call it Hack the District. We'll get you know, local developers to build new web and, and uh, Facebook and, and mobile applications and see and he said, I love it, but call it apps for democracy because hack the district's just not going to fly with us. Right? So we launched this in 30, let's see, we're, the first year, 47 web, iPhone, and Facebook apps were built. The, the city estimated the value of those apps to be in excess of $2.3 million. And the way they did the calculation, they said, what would it cost us on an hourly basis to pay every single programmer to build these applications based on the scopes that we assume those applications encompassed? Um, but, which is actually the bigger piece, which is probably 1.3 here, the cost of the human resources of the DC government from a from a contract manager and a project manager perspective to manage the actual building of those applications. Um, cost them five, 50 grand, some crazy ROI, whatever. So we said, you know what? We didn't do this because we want to be government contractors. We don't really care about contracts with the government. Or we, like I said, we don't really focus on the money. So we released our method to the world. And in two years, 40 countries and cities and organizations stood up apps for democracy competitions. So first was apps for America. Apps for Healthy Kids, Apps for Inclusions, Apps for Finland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Amsterdam, Australia, Victoria. I think Australia has done like three or four different ones. They're really excited about open government and open data. Um, and so I think we've, we've made an impact uh, there somehow. And I think that our idea that open innovation is important, that we should share what we know how to do, we should share how we solve problems is, is really important. What happened next was the Army reached out to us. And the Army CIO, uh, Lieutenant General Jeffrey Sorensen, so Peter, do you think, well, he was speaking with Tim O'Reilly out on the West Coast, and Tim is a big champion of our work, and they came up with this idea that maybe they, this could be done within the DOD. So I walk into the Pentagon, um, I don't know if you can see on the screen here, you know, I'm typically wearing pumas and, and jeans, and I struggled, I was like, should I put a tie on? And I was like, it's not a wedding, and it's not a funeral, at least I hope it's not my funeral coming in here. So no, I'm going to go in as I go. Um, and so I sit there with Tim and, and the general, but also the CIOs of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And it was really interesting that they were so interested in what we were doing. And I was like, whoa, this is a pretty serious room. Um, how can I help? Right? Which is a typical question I ask, because it's the quickest way to get, get down to what people's problem is and figure out how to help them. 
And I said, well, you know, we have this latent demand for innovation within the Army um, and the DOD in general and all the branches. Um, we don't have a way for soldiers specifically to solve their own problems from a technology point of view. They're hacking together applications on the battlefield. They're using spreadsheets to do stuff that spreadsheets aren't meant for. Can you fix this? And I was like, well, all right. Do you guys have technologists in the Army? Do you think you've got developers in there? He said, well, we'll put it this way. We've got 1.4 million employees. I said, OK, that's the basically the biggest company on the planet. Um, we decided apps for defense wasn't going to work. It was going to be too hairy to get that kind of thing done. Um, so we said, let's pilot it. The General said, Let, General Sorensen said, let's pilot at the Army and see what happens. So um, God, after many, many months of getting through all sorts of Army regulations, AR 5-17 ended up being our hero to let us basically do employee cash incentives. Only soldiers and Army civilians were able to participate in apps for the Army. And that was really important, because this was not about contractors being able to demonstrate their awesome technology so they hopefully could get a contract. This was about soldiers who are on the battlefield, or civilians if they're in a, in a fort or in the Pentagon or whatever, being able to solve their problems faster, giving them the permission and the methodology to do that. So we stood up a secure cloud uh, with DISA. It's called a race environment, the first time it had ever been used. And in 75 days, 119 developers participated and built 53 uh, web and mobile applications. 17 of those were Android, 16 were iPhone, the rest were, were web-based. They did all sorts of crazy, amazing things. Um, What's the most interesting about this and about this open innovation methodology, um, we showed the Army and told the Army how we did everything that we did for this. And now it's a program within the Army. They don't need us for it. We solve that problem. We don't have a contract. I don't want one. If we do our job right, we solve the problem and you never talk to us again. right? I didn't set out to say, we want to pull big contracts out of the government. Actually, I'm not a war hawk at all. I mean, let's not spend our money on war hawk. So if this method lets us save, you know, this is probably 20 or $30 million worth of application development that got, got done by soldiers instead of our typical big contractors. That's what makes me really happy. In a totally different vein, I mean, um, thinking about platforms and thinking about how you actually stimulate creativity and collaboration among a disparate group of people. DC Week, as I mentioned earlier, this is a total experiment. Um, we launched it last year, as I said, and, and three months later, 6,000 people showed up. We'll have 10,000 people this year. It's really just a place for us to experiment and say, what could happen when all of this talent gets together? So we map talent. We say, who are videographers? Who are animators? Who are developers? Who are designers? Who are mobile application developers? Who are entrepreneurs? Who are all these people? And then we create these projects together. And we say, OK, that last year we did a pop-up incubator. We did $125,000 worth of pro bono consulting. Um, we built apps for Ben's Chili Bowl. right? So there's a developer's face on the wall of Ben's Chili Bowl in Washington, DC, next to Obama and Cosby. right? That's a big deal if you know what Ben's Chili Bowl is about. Uh, we did like computer drives and internet literacy training classes. We built a pop-up incubator in an emerging neighborhood called H Street so that local businesses could come and talk to our designers that are in our community and talk to our developers and talk to our marketers to understand, how can I sell more pies on H Street? Right? When most of these folks are probably hanging out in northwest Washington, DC, maybe a little bit too much, we need to circulate that talent around the city and get more done faster and strengthen that entire ecology of business. And if we do that, we have a stronger city. Right. We all did all sorts of crazy hacks where we set up a user voice platform. And there were 12,000 voters submitting 38,000 votes just on the bands for the closing party. right? So an open ideation platform um, to do that. And then I mentioned before DC Tech Meetup. If any of you are in this room today, have a chance the first Tuesday of every month. It's about 600 to 800 people all focused on technology. Um, we also do a startup accelerator. We said there's people are like, oh, startup Y Combinator. I'm like, shoot me, I, no way. Um, y Combinator is Y Combinator. So instead, we do 36 hours in a weekend. It's like startup weekend to a certain extent. Teams don't form during the weekend. They come in. right? They're fully baked. They're already working on something. They pitch investors at the end of the weekend. It's been really exciting for the region. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, this is how we've been, become so successful in such a short period of time. We decided that we're going to be what the community wants us to be. That if we listen and if we're that close to the community, we'll just be shaped by it. And that's really important. We see the full ecosystem. And then we get the heck out of the way. Right? We do something great. We get out of the way, tell you how to do it, and that's it. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. I love the name of